What if your smartphone could always sense how you feel? Hi there, my name is Gerrit Heikop and I'm here at the Future of Information and Communication Conference in Singapore talking to some of the authors of the best reviewed papers. And in this episode we're talking to Liu Zhang, who just got off stage, who's probably one of the youngest contributors here at the conference, about her paper titled When Siri Knows How You Feel, Study of Machine Learning and Automatic Sentiment Recognition from Human Speech. Liu, welcome. Hello, welcome. Just just for our viewers, how old are you at the moment? Um, 19, <laughs> but 19. I just graduated from uh, high school. Yeah, so it's called junior college in, Ch in Singapore. Yeah, well, and, and you actually uh, conducted this research project still in high school, and here you are already at presenting at an international conference about, yeah, about Siri and, and basically sentiment analysis and emotion recognition. Why? Is it important that our devices around us can sense our emotions? All right. So um, I um, I first know that this um, field actually is this called uh, sentiment analysis by watching a movie. So the movie is called Her. So um, it's about uh, a man who falls in love with his Siri-like software. So after I have uh, watched the movie, I the first thought is. That's creepy. But then I thought about it. Um, I was thinking whether machine can really understand human emotions and, you know, sentiments. I feel like um, there are quite a lot of real life significance to that. For example, in business organizations, the uh, companies might want to find out how the customers feel about their products. And um, politicians, they might also want to know the general sentiments um, like among their voters. And also it has a great potential to help with psychiatric treatments as well as um, human um, robots interactions. So for example, chatbot. So a lot of this um, comes down to, um, you know, sentiment analysis as well as how we can, you know, harness the machine aspect which can, you know, um, into a lot of data to harness on that to capitalize on this ca technology to actually you know make use of those you know sentiments to you know discover new knowledge exactly so what was it that you set out to find where's the innovation in your research um, so in my research I actually uh, built up my own database so um, I've noticed um, initially I want to find um, you know a pu avail public available database but you know sometimes it's hard to find and uh, you know during um, high school it's I don't have a lot of resources to that so basically I thought of creating my own database from YouTube, which is uh, a public um, available social media platform. And also a, a plus is that in YouTube video, you have a lot of them talking about their sentiments, opinions about, uh, you know, current, um, you know, for example, at that time there was this uh, Brexit. So there are a lot of like current videos expressing their sentiments. So that's one of my innovation. And secondly, it's I um, study linguistics in high school. So I use that knowledge to actually um, innovate in the linguistic analysis of the uh, the aspect of my research. So I innovate, uh, I came up with this uh, sentiment score, um, which is a formula that can calculate the, sen uh, give a general sentiment score to each of the speech segments. So that's one of uh, the things that I um, thought of is, um, you know, like a mo new model that can, you know, summarize the linguistic information salient to the sentiment. So that's two of my highlights. Yeah, so, so that's language analysis. Now I understand you also looked into auditive analysis. Tell us more about that. So uh, for the acoustic, um, so basically my research include two parts. One is linguistic analysis, one is acoustic analysis. So both the, ling the language content as well as, you know, the, the sound itself. So uh, I look into that because when people express their sentiments, they might use, you know, like their, the, the pitch really matters to uh, their sentiment, um, sentiment and as, as well as their intensity of their voice. So basically, um, I include the information about intensity as well as pitch, as well as the voice quality. So voice quality here is um, basically jitter, shimmer, as well as 
um, harmonics to noise ratio, which is um, the most salient thing to sentiment. Yeah. Har harmonics to noise, because I, I'm curious, do we already really understand what different emotions sound like? Is it easy to classify? Um, yeah, I think it's still a challenge, even as of now. So for my project, um, in order to you know uh, start with something more simple, um, I start with the general sentiment, so classifying all the speech uh, segments into um, positive as well as negative. So that's, um, for me, is the first step to you know actually do sentiment classification. Of course, now as of now, I'm working on more exciting things to classify, you know, like the emotion itself. So I use um, like the emotional, there are a lot of emotional models there out there. So I choose to use this um, uh, emotion model, which include four quadrants. Um, you know, one axis is arousal and one axis is um, valence. So when you have high arousal, high valence, um, probably you are happy or like you are excited. Yeah. Yeah. And so this quadrant model actually uh, give us a more accurate you know, picture about the emotion itself rather than um, my uh, this work about sentiment, which is more general. So it's a black and white, positive and negative. Exactly. And that, that was basically the basis done in high school. As you said, you're now going deeper. What do, what do your findings mean for the future research? What, what, what do people who get excited about this need to start working on? Um, as of now, I work as a research intern at National University of Singapore, uh, working on, you know, like uh, emotion recognition from the EEG signals, which is the brainwave, the brainwave. In, yeah, yeah. in the layman's term. And then, um, uh, using deep neural network, like um, uh, uh, actually the architecture is uh, a hybrid deep neural network. So basically, Wh which what means uh, in what sense is it hybrid? Yeah. So it's a combination of um, you know uh, the convolutional neural network as well as the LSTM recurrent neural network. So basically, um, due to the um, the nature of EEG signal, we have um, you know um, this time sequence so it's a sequence data which is suitable for our um, to use rnn however we are doing some innovation about like you know map it map the signal itself to uh, some form of image to um, capitalize on the you know now nowadays image recognition is very accurate so there is a hybrid amount like between these two so we aim to use um, you know, this kind of innovation to uh, try to see if this can actually accurately predict the emotion itself. To actually add a third source of data, do I understand correctly? So you have linguistic, you have audio, and now you can use the graphs also as an input? Um, now for my current work, it's uh, only the EEG signal, which doesn't include the, the voice. Um, because the initial motivation is um, you know, to objectively measure the physiological aspects um, for children who has some uh, speech deficiencies. So they um, have lost the, uh, you know, uh, the normal speech functions and some of them have neuro neurological disorders. So we want to, you know, um, more objectively measure and so they can ex to help them express, sort emotions. of express their emotions. So that's why we are only focusing on the EEG signal yeah. um, to see if we can, you know, predict the emotion from there. Exactly. But in, in general, it's just adding another layer of sensing emotions. If we later on combine all these together, then yeah. we might end up in an area where the smartphone really in real time understands how, how we feel. feel. As well as, um, uh, nowadays we have a lot of like wearable technology so for this we can you know expand it to multi-model uh, you know sentiment analysis or emotion recognition so basically you have all these exciting things that look very futuristic but might uh, be able to benefit us in the future so we can also apply it into psychiatric treatments so for example the the psychiatrist can use it as an assistant for them to better, you know, assess the emotional states of their patients, and by you know using like wearable technology, it has potential to, you know, have you know more access to you know like uh, real real time analysis of emotion, and also probably we can 
you uh, apply that into human robot interaction. So you know, like when um, the robot, especially now this chatbot, they can e assess your emotion first, and then you know, uh, when you are down, they make some jokes to cheer yeah. you up, something like that. But um, we still have a lot of uh, things to consider before we went into that. So. Um, yeah, but the aspect of it is exciting. Yeah. Yes, very exciting work. Well, thank you. We just moved from better customer service to actually improving the healthcare system and the mental health of the disabled. Liu Zhong, thank you very much for sharing this insight and thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. If you're curious about more of these exciting innovations presented here at the Future of Information and Communication, click around on the SAI conference website or on our YouTube channel and hit that subscribe button right now so you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out. We just hope to see you at one of our future conferences.